so much of my time now has been invested into people, into bringing in the right people, into creating some longevity, a sustainable business really is through bringing in the right people. Welcome to Long-Term Thinking for Business Success, a show for and by business owners. Each episode will explore how to beat the odds and create a sustainable business and the life we've dreamt of. Today's guest is Greg Thomas from Sterling Computing. Sterling is a 100-year-old company that works with the timber, plumbing, and building supplies industries to improve productivity and create cost efficiencies so that their clients can reach their full potential. Greg has been the CEO of Sterling for the past 20 years and has overseen the company's growth and the evolution of the business's flagship product, Frameworks, into a SaaS-based solution. Hi, Greg. Welcome to the Long-Term Thinking for Business Success podcast, and thank you for joining us. Hi, Rick. Pleased to be here. Thanks, Greg. Just to start things off, can you tell us about Sterling? What's the change you want to make? Or to put that another way, what's the vision or purpose you're trying to deliver? And who do you hope to help? And as you mentioned in the intro, it's a 100-year-old business that's evolved out of a building supplies organization into a software company. Where we are now, our passion is to make customers' businesses thrive, specifically targeting the building supplies market. Really, it's about what we do to ensure their success. In effect, we know if they're successful, we're going to be successful. That's great. Thank you for that. Just to give us a better understanding of your 20-year journey mm. within the 100-year-old company that Sterling is. Can you tell us what the company looked like when you joined compared to what it is today? I joined the business at so 23, so what's that, 2003. So they'd just come out of a, quite an interesting growth cycle at the end of Y2K, like a lot of companies, software companies at that point in time. So they had a lot of clients who were in over the last three years who'd really come in during that time. So the business was very staid in its ways. It was an organization that had been a very traditional software company at that point in time that was very casually structured, very autocratic. The guy who was in charge there, who was my boss, Scott Perry Jones, a great guy, but very much ruling the risk with everything he did. So there wasn't a lot of depth underneath him. He effectively, together with the other board member, Peter Lees, were looking for an exit strategy for themselves as early as that. So they were really targeting to bring someone into the business to take on their role. So that's where I came in. I took on the ownership of that CEO role. And where the business is now, we've been purchased now. So Scott and Peter sold the business and got purchased by an American company. We were at the time when I joined, I think we were 20 people. We're now 62 with revenue threefold, probably even fourfold of where it was at that point in time. So it's a vastly different business model and vastly different culture, I would suggest as well. Well, I'm sure it's completely different. We'll come mm. back to explore definitely the culture side of it. And mm. I'm also be really interested to talk through some of the sale and the insights you've got that. Mm. I'm sure a number of our listeners are considering how to drive the sale of their business. Just thinking back to the 20 year history, you've been there. It sounds yep. like you've done a huge number of changes. What are you most proud of from the change you've made over the last 20 years? There's probably two things, I think. I mentioned culture. So I think within the organization, the culture that's evolved now, having a much more client success focus is one that I'm exceedingly proud of. It's more about what we're delivering out there rather than about what we're achieving internally and the money we're earning. That's been an exciting evolution in that one that I'm most proud of, funny enough, rather than the traditional things of software and money and revenue. But closely behind that, though, is the rewrite of our legacy application, which was branded ProStix, over a very long period of time into what we now market out there, which is Frameworks. So getting that completed and now seeing sales just coming through at a rate we're even struggling to complete is, is absolutely fascinating for us. And uh, I absolutely love the fact that we've got it to a position that we had a vision of probably 12 years ago. Congratulations. Mm. Just diving into that, you mentioned it earlier, the change you're trying to do was always about client success and that would breed mm. and deliver your success. Is there a client that you could share a story of the impact you've had on their business? COVID was an interesting time for many businesses and its evolution, I think, that came with it. We were literally going into COVID, had just been purchased by DMSI, the company in our own Sterling. We'd fallen into COVID with what was going to happen. Where are we going to be? Are going to have a business anymore? The companies we're servicing are going to have a business anymore. In discussions with both my management here and the owners over there, we decided to be very aggressive in using that opportunity to change the way that we did things. 
and change our model. In doing that, we'd have a very good solid cash position. We were able to go out there very quickly to organisations and reach out to those ones who were in financial stress themselves. And we paused their subscriptions during that time. So we actually reached out to them and paused probably around about 50% of our organisations for a six-month period, their subscriptions, as a way to give them opportunity to keep on using the system and using that, that benefit to modify the business without actually the, burden, the financial burden of it. We changed the way we were looking to service our customers where every phone call was a write a check type thing. If they asked anything outside the bounds of what was their proper sport contract, we really focused on the fact that they need whatever they need to be successful. We modified our terms and conditions around our product. We simplified our support model and really reached out to our customers to ensure they asked of us without a fear of sending them an invoice. We got a lot of credibility in that and success out of the back end of it. We operate with a buying group called ITM over in New Zealand and where we've had a long-standing customer there and we picked up another one and then we did all of this. And as a result of that, now I think we've got 22 ITM members now use our product because the word went about. I remember receiving a note from the CEO of one of our customers there. When I told him about holding his subscriptions and supporting his business, he actually wrote on the back of it, and this is why I chose Sterling. And so it was lovely just to pass that sort of stuff on. We talk a lot about how do we create remarkable experiences for our clients. And then mm. when we talk with our clients, we talk about how we can help them make remarkable experiences for them and for their clients. That's a great example of how investing in the client relationship can return tenfold. That's fantastic. Oh, absolutely. It's looking at the proper metrics. I've learned a lot from working with the American company where my previous owners were very focused on profitability and bottom line sort of stuff and keep the expenses low if the revenue's not there and this constant in and out of investment. These guys are focused on key metrics. It's churn for us for subscriptions. It's how many licenses we've got. Is that growing? If that's growing, then everything else is going to come along for the ride. It's an interesting perspective. It's really using lead indicators to drive the business rather than mm. lag indicators. Absolutely. Which is a very different perspective. How much of that came from the new owners, the American partners, versus were ideas that were already in the business and just couldn't surface because of the owners prior to the sale? Yeah, it's an interesting thing. And one was that we picked up. So it's a I'm going to say it's a bit of both. It's a bit of both, undoubtedly, and some good reaction at times. But so what we got out of DMSI was probably two key things in the early phases. And what they were totally unable to engage locally because they couldn't travel. So we were pretty much on our own. And I was having fortnightly phone calls with them. So there's no lot you can do. But, but certainly their culture and their lead indicator focus, their comfortability and lack of push from an early, from a, from a buyer to get the numbers and get their return on investment really quickly and everything else came through very clearly. So they were in this for the long haul. They didn't buy Sterling just for a quick turnaround and make sure they got their, their return on investment inside of five years type thing. They were there for the long haul and that message came across really well. Good. For us, moving out of what was then a, a different model, I guess, with the previous owners, because that's what needs demanded, where they were focused on revenue and focused very heavily on profit, that stopped initiatives, that, that stopped investment. That stop longer term investment, especially when they are in a seller mode and trying to sell the business. They needed to ensure the metrics were looking all all as best to get the best price for the business. So, it really that opening up of that opportunity gave us a chance to truly spread our own wings. And whilst I was CEO and I reported to a board, there was still that underlying limitations that was in place with me there with the previous owners. Talks to a lot of the purpose of this podcast and a lot of what we're doing. Our purpose in inside our group is really about building sustainable success for us, mm -hmm. for our team, and then for our clients. When you take a longer term view of a business, it allows you to make decisions very differently than public companies that have to make decisions quarter by quarter. As you say, you had a board or owners that were all about the short term focus. They had their own drivers and desires for that. The longer term you can think about it and the deeper you can take that into consideration, the more successful we can be as small business owners. Oh, absolutely. I've got absolute admiration for the previous owners in where they got the business to. I don't think I could start a software company from scratch and get it to where they got it to. I think it's admirable and their experience in really getting it there. Like everything else, there's a timeline to that and their skills were great in doing that and then maintaining it and getting a good working profitability model. The next step really was outside of the bounds of where they could truly really take it to. So they sold it at the right time to their credit as well. Thank you for that. A couple of questions about your mm -hmm. role. In creating a sustainable company, and obviously yours has been extremely sustainable, it's 100 year old, and I imagine it's got a, at least 100 years more to go. Mm. In the last 20 years, I'm sure your role has continually changed. What, when you think back again over the 20 years, what have been some of the most significant changes in your role 
And when you look back, were they intentional changes that you drove or were they much more circumstance driven? When I joined the organisation, mine was one of a caretaker role, I would suggest, rather than actually changing it to be a growing business. So I came in, I picked up what these guys were trying to achieve. They had a a fairly short-term view of probably the next five years of trying to sell the business. What they wanted me to do is to keep things going, keep the profitability up, get the most out of what we had and really squeeze it as hard as you possibly could. So my role was really more financially based than investment and growth based, undoubtedly, which is good to hone some good solid skills there. Having a good sort of financial knowledge and looking at the right balance sheet and p and items is always a good thing, unnecessary in business. But that was really where I invested a huge amount of my time. We had an aging application that was slowly winding down in new business sales and very rapidly wound down at a certain juncture as well. Phases for me really at that point in time was getting the business running and squeezing something out of it up until the time they could try to sell it. And their first sale attempt was around about 2008, which went on for a few years and failed and really disengaged me and disengaged the owners heavily during that time. So once that re-engagement happened, let's see if we can grow this thing a little bit. Really my role then started to look heavily into the product and what we need to do with the product and that decision about do we rewrite, do we resell, do we start all over again and create something which for anyone who's been involved in software development is a massive undertaking, a massive undertaking. It was then trying to grow and build a new product at the same time as keeping the profitability going. So managing the investment, and it was a real pendulum flow of yeah. I'll put a little bit here, I've got to take it back over here, I've got to put a little bit here, I've got to take it back over there type thing to, to get a level of investment we could to build this product out. It certainly changed from that perspective into doing it. And then I guess as DMSI have come in and really at the back end of uh, the previous owners, my role then was starting to look at what is my legacy. I need then to look at the people side of it. And over the last 24 months, so much of my time now has been invested into people, into bringing in the right people, into creating some longevity, a sustainable business really through bringing in the right people. And there's been a lot of shakeup in the organization through that cycle, now allowing me to more strategize on the business as I have these people underneath me really doing the job and doing yeah. the job better than I could. We'll come back to that point a little bit more. I don't know if you're a fan of Jim Collins, business writer. Yep. His starting point for everything is get the right people on the bus. Don't worry no. about where the bus is going. And it is so true. Today, your job title as CEO in small businesses, of which you're still a small or medium-sized mm. business, there's no question of that. Job title doesn't really tell us what you do. And you've alluded to mm. your focus is very much on team and I assume the leadership of that team. What are your top priorities as a CEO and how do you ensure you remain focused on those and don't get drawn back into the day-to-day -day operations or parts of the business that you could easily spend days working in? Up front, I do it poorly some weeks and I do it great other weeks, like all of us. It was interesting. We've done some good business planning of late and we've adopted a methodology called EOS, Entrepreneurial Operating System, which I love. Now we're really using it and truly investing in it. As are we. Uh, yeah. In its first instance, it's a great way to shake you off and go, no, this is what we're doing. Don't do that. This is what we're doing. So it's keeping us well and truly focused on it. That is helping a lot in what I'm doing. At our most recent annual planning exercise, one of the cycles we went through there is where everyone had the opportunity to confront each one of your peers with a, what is the best thing about you and what do we want you to stop doing type thing. And the message came out really strongly out of my team. We want you to stop getting involved in everything. So you're touching everything, which is not allowing us to grow. And you're touching everything, which is limiting where we want to go. So that was a strong message. Probably a little bit hard to swallow at times. But in some ways, it probably reaffirmed the necessity that we have to bring in these people and let them grow. And uh, them evolve because their evolution is the business's evolution. Part of that is that, that constant reassessment then of, okay, am I doing the job I'm meant to be doing? Or am I letting these guys really do and do what they need to do? And I guess because it's been brought forward so much, I have a little sticky note sitting on the screen, which is don't get involved in everything. And it's just really, as I do it, and I know I could stick my nose in there and do it, I just bite my tongue and just pull out. So it's that constant reaffirmation of what I need to do. And then strategy becomes key to it. And strategy is locking down a 10-year goal. It's locking down a three-year goal. It's looking at the evolution of that. It's looking at actually the key metrics of it and defining as the OS lot you now drives you through every quarter, every week, ensuring that you keep that at the forefront of your mind as you look at your, your planning. There's plenty of things that I do want to dive into there, and mm. a few of them will come up later on. But just in the context of EOS, and I'm sure a number of the listeners will know 
the entrepreneurial operating system is. And if you don't, you could Google EOS and it'll come up or look for Gino Wickman, who's the creator of it. But just thinking through that process, and there are lots of components to it, is there one aspect of EOS that has been really profound for you in implementing it? The disciplines associated with the management goals, rocks as they're called, and the constant necessity to reaffirm those, bring those up at every single L10, every single meeting that we have with the management and leadership team, and holding each other to account. I think it has been great. It's that quarterly planning cycle to build these things, but then it's that constant enforcement of, okay, so what are you doing that for, Greg? That's not a rock for this quarter. Does that need to change? What are the issues we need to raise and then do about that? It's been the first time I think that we've actually had something documented in front of us. Uh, It's just the simplicity of that formality of the hour and a half meeting, go through the cycle, make sure you are what you are. Let's talk about the issues related to that. Let's not go off and have a general chat. Our challenge with rocks has been defining them too big at the beginning of the quarter mm. and then getting into them and realizing Couldn't agree more. it just we just can't bite that off. And doing less yep. is far more impactful than doing more. Yep. I agree with you more. It's interesting as you start this, you think, oh, great, I'm going to get them all down here and I'm absolutely going to get all these nailed. And you finish the end of the quarter and you sit down with implementer or your facilitator and you look at your success rate. Yeah, we got three of 15 completed type thing. And what are you going to do with the other 15? Are they going to go into next quarter? Oh, no, they probably weren't really that important. We'll let them go. And it's just, it's quite comical as you go through it in some ways to yeah. the last quarter, we did seven. We had seven rocks and we completed seven rocks. And it was, we're all sitting down there so incredibly proud of us. So it was not, couldn't wait until we had the facilitator for the next quarterly planning so we could tell them what was going on. That's great. It's been an exciting journey, actually. And yeah, I'm finding the quarterly conversations and the values chart do you have the values and do you have then the capacity and the knowledge and the desire to do the job that you're being mm. asked to do is really enabling to have conversations with my team that i was really uncomfortable having previously the framework across the whole of the, the, the framework the different is, frameworks yeah, it gives you to be able to raise issues openly and mm. productively not as a judgment to the person sitting next to you is just fantastic Yes, we did some investments, values, and driving those things home. And we've got some of the collateral. You've got your mouse pads and your drink bottles and your quarterly awards and everything else like that. And the reaffirmation each. And so we have a monthly meeting with all of our employees. And it's all led from the values and exactly what we're doing. We call out those people that aren't living the values and we raise those people who are, but in a supportive way. So it's just simply, again, bringing that in, actually believing in it. Yep. The value is often you do your values and you go through the cycle and you come up with something gimmicky. You make sure it says the right thing, which we did. But then it took probably another couple of quarters to actually sit down and go, she I really believe in these. Yeah. That's the model I want to employ people on. That's the model I want to pay people more on. It's just yeah. a more common size. It's nice. Yeah, thing. completely agree. I love the proposition. And we do lots of work, as you may remember, around proposition and values. Mm. Because I'll come back to marketing on the inside of your business. But for me, values are observed, never told. So most common people tell you what your values are. They put it on a water bottle, on a screensaver, mm. or pin it up on the wall. But Actually, what people see happening is what the values are, not what mm. we tell you what our values are. Yep. Again, just because I know what you mean by we do a weekly or monthly call out. Some of our listeners won't know what EOS is and what that means. So can you just talk through what do you mean by a values call out and actually what on a practical level, what you guys do to do that? Sure. So we have a monthly meeting with all normal stuff. I've got less than half of my workforce now on the Central Coast. So I've got Fiji, I've got Manila, I've got Melbourne, I've got Brisbane. So I've got people pretty much scattered everywhere. So we get together virtually on a big Zoom meeting. And myself and the management team do a run through. We lead it by running through our rocks and how we're achieving for them in terms of what we believe. And we talk about that early in the piece. So we take them through what our strategies and plans are and goals are for the quarter and we lead through that. And then we really finish up there with an award. We will go through again the values. Okay, guys, here's our values. You've all got it. You know, hopefully you're all looking at this and understanding. But then we'll call out a specific value and talk to someone who has lived this from a real-world example. Exemplary customer service was the one that we had actually only a couple of days ago. And it was talking to why what this person did truly represented this value. And whilst he wouldn't have been doing it because you seen it on a drink bottle, he went that bit further. He truly engaged with the customer in a way and went above and beyond what they'd even asked in a way that was just superb. It was exemplary customer service. It's just really spending the time to acknowledge that is just what we're finding is key. Whilst they get a $100 gift voucher from Westfield, just virtually inconsequential. It's the call out in front of their peers, which means the most. 
It's not inconsequential. The purpose of the recall and reward is that it reinforces that this is the behavior we want. Mm. And more and more people will do that. And then the people that don't will realize this is not the place that I am comfortable in, which is Mm. fantastic. That's ultimately what we want. It's a good base also for the harder discussions as well, which inevitably happen. And it gives you a reference point to go back to straight away when you're talking to people. So it's not a personalized thing. It's not a chastising. Fred, what you've done here doesn't live up to our value of elevate the team. You've approached it in this way that hasn't elevated your team, that hasn't done the right thing by your peers. And that's not our value system. It's a really great tool to reference back to, one that I'm... Early in the piece, I guess I was a little bit of fluff, but I guess now living it, I truly understand the purpose of it. I've had the same epiphanies that have absolutely been driven through EOS. And there were things that I knew, but they come together. Mm. Look, just to go slightly deeper on on this point, and you've mentioned this earlier, and not specifically EOS driven, Mm. but I expect it will be part of your answer. Sure. As I'm sure you appreciate, a business is just a collection of people and people being people. The goal is to get us all to work as effectively as we can together. What processes and tools do you use to motivate and mentor your staff? And let's just Mm. start with the leadership team to get the best out of them. And then how have these changed as the company's grown? So as you said, you started with 20 people and Mm. obviously you were relatively naive in terms of what your leadership and management style was at that point. But I'm sure over the 20 years that's changed. So how have you personally and how has the company changed its processes for managing and mentoring the team? Obviously, EOS is going to come into that as one of the one of the tools and processes that's key to us. To talk on that one first, EOS as a, an operating system, a managed a entrepreneurial operating system is about putting it through the entire organization. So it's not just about the leaders and the management team up top playing it out. The L10, which is the leadership team meeting, rolls all the way through the organization departments. So our goals become their goals or a subset of their goals. They're, they've got to drive to those. They create their own their own issues and strengths and everything else like that, but it all feeds upwards, which is key. So the process of that is bringing us more together as a cohesive unit going in a common direction where before I'd be comfortable in saying we, we were siloed. I had my support guys doing this, my services guys doing that, my sales guys doing something else, let alone what I was doing. So it actually helped to get us all and the ship moving in a single direction. That, that was the joy of putting this thing in place, now, whether it's iOS or something else. I think the core of it is you can't just be a manager and the leadership team pushing the things through because your employees become disjointed. They don't see and understand the reasons for doing things. So therefore, how can they possibly be on board and understand why they're doing the wrong thing or the right thing? Having a framework with which to deliver to that has been great. It's just been great. I think it's all something naturally and inherently we know is the right thing, but how do you actually get there has been the issue. So that's the, one of the core processes. I think like we've invested in a, been a 60-person company and HR, welcome on board type thing. It's how do you go and evolve those sort of things? How do you get in and utilize proper review processes? How do you look at remuneration and actually structure these things a little bit differently to what traditionally you've done, where it's just been, we're going to make a decision what we're going to pay people type thing. So we've invested in a couple of products to help the process of onboarding people, having better structures to to bring people on now than what was traditionally no structure. The people I used to bring on, their survival rate was very limited to those who could actually be self-taught. And I used to employ people, literally telling them that. But now I've got some good onboarding structures, some good methodologies under which to do it. We've got good, solid review processes through. Values become a key part of those reviews. Goals and goal delivery become a key part of those reviews. So they're the, probably the, the three things that come to my mind. Thank you for that. Just to go slightly differently, the most valuable learnings we get come from a setback or hardship. Can you tell us a story of an adverse event or challenge that mm. you've had to deal with at Sterling? either at a company or even potentially at a personal level, but that's driven a positive change within the business? Two things are coming to mind straight away. I mentioned before the business went through a a first sale process back in 2008. I probably went through quite a substantial maturity jump, I think, at that point in time, even at a professional level. Because I watched the guys trying to sell the business. I got wholly and solely wrapped up into that because I was going to pick up a financial return on that if the business sold. And then when it didn't sell, the disconnect I went through and the owners went through on the business was was hard. It was actually really hard getting up each and every day. I, I, remember, I think Ricky and I even talked about this when we first engaged a long time ago, but it was really hard to get up each day and truly want to get in and do the business because you'd spent the last two years preparing the thing for sale and it couldn't sell. And then we went to the GFC type thing, I think it was, that sort of was the final nail in the coffin. So 
the learnings I really got out of that were, again, whilst I said DMS, I brought in some of the things about looking lead metrics. It also enforced me a little bit of some of that as well at that point in time because it was getting out and looking again at people, getting out and looking again at see if the customers and what's our engagement with the customers going on and everything else like that. So it changed, I guess. I sort of gained strength from seeing the success of the people, be their customers or my staff, which really got me engaged back into the business because I'd lost it. I'd truly lost it. And I was at a point of thinking I needed to move on. So that was certainly a hard time. It was a very hard time, but a good learning time for me to see there's more than just the dollars and cents at the back end of it all. Losing customers is hard, especially when they're big ones, because we've all probably gone through it. We have a customer in New Zealand who approached us at one point in time and like all issues you often find with customers, a new person's come in, it's a new CIO or it's a new general manager or something like that who has their own view of the world. His customers were substantially larger than us and he approached us and said, listen, we're too big for you. We want to do all of this. We don't think you can do that. We want to do all this investment. So we think we need to go to a much bigger application, much bigger organization. It was a devastating moment. They were far and away our biggest customer, far and away our biggest customer. We did all that we could and felt that we did it all. But when you look back at what we did do, we were disengaged from the business for probably two years, just coasting, just yep. really coasting along and not valuing that investments. So when that all happened, that, that was hard. We made some core decisions though at that time, which... I don't think they were overly strategic. It was just more of a value as an internal value and integrity position. We made the, the decision between myself and a couple of guys that we would continue to support these guys better than what we had done before, even though they were leaving the shores. We did that. We really looked after them. We helped them through their transition. We allowed them to even keep licenses on because they needed to go back to it at certain times and didn't take the application from them. They changed over to that system. Then it was about two years later, I got a call from the then... IT manager there to say, listen, this isn't working. What's it going to cost us to come back to you? Because you're the business we want to work with. We've seen what it is to go to the other side and all, all the glitz and glamour just isn't what it's made up to be. We want to get back to you. We want to talk about this and see what we can do to achieve this. Just keeping those relationships through that time just goes to prove and just look at your own integrity. There's nothing more valuable or no. exciting for a client coming back with mm -hmm. their tail between their legs and acknowledging that we'd made the wrong decision. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, seeing the yeah. value and just staying close and not just yeah. simply acting like a spoiled brat and go, well, you go. You go, if you don't want me to want us anymore, we've got better things to do. This circles all the way back to the values. Mm. And one of your values that you mentioned earlier was around customer service. When the going gets tough, your value means that you still deliver the same, if not better, mm. quality of customer service. And mm. that's the reason why. Your first story, which was about your personal mindset and growth, is really interesting. We've all learned so much over the last few years around the role that mindset plays in everything we do. Today, given the business is obviously in a very different position, operating very differently, but I have no doubt that mindset is still a key factor for you. I don't mm. know how much you do or don't struggle with imposter syndrome, but I have no doubt that at some point <laughs> you do it oh, today absolutely. as you did then. We yeah. all do. There's no yeah. question. So yeah. what do you do every day to maintain your resilience and drive through those days that you go, oh, do I really need to get up today? I'm 58. The opportunity of retirement is a little bit closer anyway than what it used to be and all those sort of things. And I look at how I was when I was in my 30s and 40s and to where I am now. And whilst maturity is an obvious statement, but first thing I do is balance is key. I put a lot of time and thinking time into this business, but I also disengage very solidly now when I'm not doing that. So I'm finding that balance and the end of the day is as beautiful as working is they're not going to be the people who are going to be beside your deathbed there's the family and there's the friends out there who are going to be doing that so i look a lot at it, a personally balance of things and knowing that if i'm am at home even though i work at home a lot but if i'm at home and i'm not working i have to make sure that i'm truly engaged into what i'm doing there i spend a lot of time also with the people that work for me to achieve that so i've still got the 30 and 40 year olds who, who want to pound away and work for 60 hour 70 hour weeks and whilst temptation is to let them, I know the greater longevity is to tell them not to. It gets your balance. If it gets done on Monday, is there any real difference type thing? So make sure you're giving yourself that time. I think a lot of those things is what re-energizes me. I've got my own side things. I'm a golfer and I'm just like playing sport and gym and fitness and things like that have always been key to me. So keeping those things up and always giving a good focus on that is, is key to me as well. And that collectively feeds what you want. Thank you for that. We define the role of marketing is to articulate the purpose and promise of the business first to the team, then to clients, and then finally to new prospects. In our language, we call it marketing on the inside and marketing on the outside. Mm. 
And it's driven by the insight that effective leaders articulate and communicate the vision and direction so that the team knows where they're going and can then independently work to get there. How do you ensure your team understand why Sterling exists and the value that you want to create to your clients? And can you share some of the rituals and habits you use to keep your vision and values top of mind? Access as a tool enforces that discipline to you. There's a two-page business plan, not a 57-page business plan, a very truncated version of what you need to do. So what is it your passion? What do we niche to do? What are our unique points of difference? What do we pledge to customers to do? And obviously then putting the metrics and the financials around a 10, a 3, a 12-month and a quarterly goal. So actually driving that whole thing through it all with a constant relook up at where we are and what we're doing. Coming up with that information as a group was great, where traditionally I would be jotting down my big word documents and business plans and, and articulating it through is getting the business involved in the whole thing. But then more than that, we're getting the leaders involved in more of that. We are, again, we send that out on a quarterly basis to the staff. So the ritual is we reaffirm this is why we're out there. We do that when we do our monthly presentation at the quarterly time and we reaffirm all of that again. This is what we've done and this is what we're here for. Everyone knows this is what we're here for. So let's just not lose sight of that. So that from a ritual sort of is a very healthy thing and one that we know the people value. We just know they value it. Um, no, that's right. They need to know what we're doing. Yeah. One of the modern changes to business management is people need to understand the purpose. It's not just about being in the same company for their mm -hmm. whole life for a salary. That doesn't mean the company needs to be a purpose-driven company saving the world. Mm. It's really understanding the value that you're creating for the people you hope to serve. And yeah. that's a lot of what we talk about is the role of marketing on the inside, making sure yeah. that is articulated and understood. Yep. Thank you for that. When I talk to business owners, I often get told that referral and recommendation are the most effective source for new leads, mm. but also that referrals are more by luck than by design or intentional. How do you generate most of your leads and do you believe it's a systematized and repeatable solution? Most of our leads come through buying groups that we work through. So ours potentially is a bit different to the average out there is we get leads by fostering relationships with buying groups. You would know about 10 and Plumbing Plus and there's electrical buying groups and ITM timber merchant buying groups and all of those sort of things. So they basically themselves are a conglomerate of, of franchise owners, sometimes owned, sometimes not owned, branded owners or non-branded owners really. But in the end, there is inherently a head office component of those buying groups. So we spend a lot of time building that relationship, even though we never sell to them, but is there referrals that effectively take us out there? We look at what their goals are. We ensure their application not only meets the goals of their members, but also meets the goals of this organisation to ensure these organisations to ensure they're maximising their return for their members. So we have this sort of symbiotic sort of relationship between us also that works and works really well. So that's where our leads come through. Yes, we still get the odd lead through. We continue to do a lot of work on our website, getting all that right. So you've got your search engine stuff and everything else like that. But it's a bit of a rarity that people actually go out there and go, I'd like to get an ERP system for the building supplies industry. Uh, and it's going to pop up. It's not really what it is. They'll ring up their people and talk to them. The other thing we've started just, which really came out of the acquisition of, of DMSI, which we're only just now getting into, is the concept, which is big in the US than over here, but net promoter score, so NPS. And that's asking a single question of the key contacts. Would you refer us to your, basically your family and friends and colleagues? measuring the drive to engage that and to grow that more and to deal with someone saying, well, I'll give you an eight out of 10 on that. When eight out of 10 is neutral, it's not, yes, they would promote an eight out of 10 is neutral. So that's engaging with them and saying, oh, I heard that. So what is it that specifically means you wouldn't? And I'm uh, not trying to get them to change their mind, but to truly understand yeah. what we're not delivering out there. So that's been a nice, rather than traditional customer satisfaction survey, it's a simple thing. People seem to have very limited problem answering it. We always balance and say, oh, if some people say 10, it's the same thing as someone else saying seven because that's just, they don't want to tell you you're doing a great job. But if that's the case, they're probably not telling their peers as well. Is that one of the key metrics that you track on your yes, scorecard then? Yes, it is. Yep. Yep. One concern I have with NPS, and I've known about, I mean, I've worked mm. in marketing, so I know NPS very well. It's a historical score. It's what they would tell you yesterday, mm. not mm. if something happens adversely in the relationship tomorrow, that could change. Overnight. Yeah, absolutely. Um, You're right. And it does change. Yeah, we, we went to we went to one of our clients up in Queensland. We've just launched our product over in the US. US colleagues come over here and we do a lot of videos prepping and doing customer success stories. We had this one guy who was just brilliant. He was just saying more fantastic things about us than what I could even imagine. 
and a great video, great collateral to, to take out to market that we're, that we're doing that now. It was only a month later that we sent the MPS out there. It was like a rating of three. <laughs> and you go, what happened there? It was over, <laughs> over a single issue, over a single issue. That was it. And then probably the month after it was 10. So, yeah, people are fickle. We know that. But you're people right. Are people. Yeah, people are people. Well, look, it's not a bad segue to the next question. I often find that the hardest lesson to learn for me is one that I often have to revisit a few times. For example, for me, it's I continually struggle with employing the right people mm. and balancing that tension between having to fill a seat mm. versus continuing the search for an ideal member. That's one of the challenges. When I look back at my 20-year history, mm. I can track it back over time that I've continually struggled with that challenge. Yep. What's a hard lesson that you've had to learn or potentially relearn a few times and how has that impacted the business? But one of the things that I now no longer do, I don't put a price tag on a job. I really don't. I look for the person I'm looking for. I'm looking for the skills I'm looking for. I don't look for the person I'm looking for and then the skills. I know that in investment is exactly that. It's an investment. And, and if someone is the sort of person you want, then you need to pay the money for it. So you don't get these highs driven out of that because that's what you put in your budget. That has been a key lesson for me and probably one that I did so early in the piece, I would absolutely try to get them in too early in their career or downplay it or pay them the lower amount of money because I really think I could take these guys along and I mean, I could pay 70000 now rather than 150000 now, but I can get there in five years' time and they get a good career growth. So I think if you've got to go out there and whilst there's an important aspect of bringing other people in at that junior level and bring them up because you need that sort of skill set as well. But it's certainly not monetizing that higher has just been one that has taken me a little while to understand yeah. many mistakes. But I think it's the importance of valuing that hiring process. I don't have a HR department. I've got a person who pays the payroll. So the hire is going to come through either myself or the manager, but it's generally going to involve me. It's an interruption to your daily job. It is such an interruption. And... Yes, using agencies is good to a certain extent, but you still got to get in. You still got to articulate things clearly. And eventually, it's a hope and a prayer when you find someone to do it. Again, DMSI has brought in a couple of toolings to help us with some of that, that psychometric type of valuation that we pay now a lot of value into. Anyone now that gets hired needs to go through that. Too. So it's absolutely, it's valuing that hiring process because these people are your success and yeah, not taking an easy road. Yeah, definitely makes sense. And this, again, the dilemma, and I imagine it's changed with the new owners, but when you're running a small business, cash flow is so king. Mm. And sometimes you just can't afford the $150,000, even no, though you, you know that person's going to drive immense value. So it's, that's mm. part of the struggle or the tension. I talk a lot about dancing with the tension of, do I want to make this decision or not? Oh. A few times you've mentioned HR and recruitment and the systems and process used on that. Mm. So that may be where you want to go with this question. Creating systems and processes undoubtedly is one of the most common answers to the question around what's enabled a business to survive over a longer period of time. Could you tell us about a system or process that has had a significant impact on the business, what that impact was? I alluded to it a little earlier when I was talking, but onboarding has probably been the greatest investment that we've done even over the last two years and the constant building of that into bringing people on to let them know about our business and allowing them to invest that time to know about our business and systems before we get them out there doing the job they've been employed to do. For us, traditionally, it was, here's a manual, have a quick read of that manual, and now let's get on and, and start you just starting to cut code or go and see a customer or go and make a sale type thing. So it was too big a rush to get them out to be of value straight away. We allow people six weeks, basically, to bed down and learn the systems that they're going to use to learn the, the history of the company, to, to understand our goals and our value system and everything else like that. And we've got a structure with which to do that, that we take them through and meet the managers who are part of this and meet the other sort of solos that operate within the business. So by giving them that six weeks, probably gets them to invest into the business a bit, which is what I like. And by the time we're letting them out to the clients, if that's the case, or letting them out internally, they've got a much better background. So for us, it's been really that, and that's been the quantum change that we've done and putting that investment in and understanding the value of that has been big for us. Interesting. Just to drive a little bit deeper into that, how much of that is self-managed? So you mentioned there in many countries around the world and definitely all over Australia. So in that distributed model, how much of that is independent onboarding and using video or reading mm -hmm. or whatever it is versus a structured person in-person mentoring process? 
It's a balance of both, so you're exactly right. We're a strong user of the Atlassian products, Benjira and Confluence and those sort of things. We use those for our project management and task ticket management and things like that. So we utilize those tools, if you like, more as a checklist and a process. It's well documented, this is what you've got to go through. We put a lot of investment into e-learning over many years, so we've got good learning systems now within both the application but also external to that. It's not only a video, it's a video and then it's questionnaires following it all. Because it's a learning management system, you're also able to track their success on that and everything else like that. And are they going through it? Are they spending five minutes on this thing that really should be taking two hours type thing? So there's a little bit of science, a little bit of auditing of it. But supplementing that again is the conversation with their peers and the conversation with the management and others around. And that's part of the, the documented flow. If it's a developer, we'll have them sit on our support desk for a week. And they'll actually take the calls and understand the calls and work through it. If it's a services person, they'll be getting out there and seeing a customer and spending time out on a customer's site. So it's all part of that induction process right. to get to know, not just us, but get to know who it is that we service. Interesting. A couple of just things that I'm toying around with and they're ideas that I've borrowed or considered borrowing from other businesses. At the end of onboarding, Netflix offer staff members at quite a sizable amount of money, so two, $3,000 yeah. at the end of an onboarding to, to leave. Because they go, I'd rather pay you out now if you're unsure than have you stay and then leave in another six months, which I thought is a really interesting technique. Yeah, it's fascinating. Yeah, it is. Yeah. 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 Or the the other question they ask at annual reviews is, would you fight for this person to stay in the business if they came to you and wanted to resign? And again, it's just an interesting question to ask of how much do you think this person does leave the Mm. values and can bring value to the business? Yeah, it's interesting. Churn of people, just like churn of customers, is it's a really hard thing. And it's a big cost to every business. It's an absolutely big cost. Yeah. Bringing people on, I had to let someone go just earlier this week, and but it invested 13 months into them. And it's devastating because you've got to start all over again. That's the most devastating part of it. Yeah. The other reality there is, I probably knew this, in one month in, procrastination is not a great friend of a successful business. Yeah, that's the point of those two methods of trying to sort that out both personally for the manager mm. and the individual to push that forward. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. For that. Just a couple more questions. Sure. A great strategy is focused on the most impactful activities. Our experience has shown that at any point, a company can really only effectively work on a finite number of priorities, typically three or four. I was mm. impressed that you mentioned seven earlier. So these are types of rock scenarios. Mm. Can you talk about one or two of your current strategic initiatives? And more importantly, what was the decision process that you used to determine these as priorities for the business? Process, I'll probably start with that, is part of the EOS quarterly planning process. So we've gone through our annual planning process. The quarterly process was really to have all the people involved in that quarterly planning to sit down and put their top three. What are your top three issues, goals for this quarter that you want to attend to. And then that all gets written down. It all gets then effectively up in the board and it gets reviewed by the team as a whole. For starters, looking at things and therefore knowing there's a trade-off to go on here that we can't, as you quite roughly said, do everything even though you want to. So there's a process sitting down and actually looking at these things and saying, okay, what realistically can we achieve? How do we prioritize A over B? And A could be one department and B could be the, another department. So it's it's that process of conversation and engagement with people and that constant reaffirmation. We can't do everything. What's the most important thing right now that we're going to do? What's going to truly impact us and what we're trying to achieve this year? And if not, does that thing need to be done this quarter or does that thing be done next quarter type thing? So it's a constant reaffirmation. First of all, we set these goals at the beginning of the year. Have they not changed? Are they not changed? Let's have a look at what we're trying to achieve in this next quarter and make sure that's aligned. And again, remember that we can't do everything in a changing world too, because you know you can set a goal and then the world moves instantly type thing. So that's the process that's worked and that's how we narrow the thing down. I say seven, our target's three to seven in total. And that's what we've been working through with the implement from day one. It was 60 people and some of those structures, some of these rocks are relatively small and churn around, but key to really balance it out and what we can achieve, I guess, is the time with us. A couple of things we're doing right now. Two, one is very much a software issue is... Our application at the moment doesn't do multi-factor authentication, which obviously with all the cyber issues going on in the world is a fairly critical component of doing it. We've had to disconnect from a number of traditional R&D items as a result of what's going on in the world and re-engage heavily into bringing in multiple multi-factor authentication into our application. What we've done, again, we make the rocks achievable in the quarter we can do. It's not, let's get multi-factor authentication into the application. It's what's the building blocks we've got to do to get there based upon a guideline to get that thing done within a 12 months period. And that's one that we've been working on that we took a good focus that was internal and external pressure. 
Another one, again, we're launching in the US. In launching our product in the US, our parent company, in fact, is selling it. They're servicing it. We really become the development shop behind them. So a lot of this is working out uh, how we're going to all operate together and getting this thing right before we make the first sale. Thank you for that. Just to push all the way back up and to, as you said, your role now is far more strategic than tactical and execution based. And your vision, I expect, for the business is now much more in line with that 10-year plan, mm-hmm. again, that I know is where EOS starts. So thinking that long-term perspective, what's one of the next or some of the key strategic initiatives that you're thinking about? So not that you're executing now, but where are your thoughts Mm. in terms of what you're hoping to implement in the future that would continue the success of the business over the next 20 years? And what do you hope they will achieve? Our 10-year goal is to be the leading provider of business software solutions to the building plumbing timber supplies market here in Australia and New Zealand and a leading provider in the US. So that's where we want to be by 2030. Number one is getting an understanding of our true position in the market as we are now. That's been key. If we are going to be the number one provider of ERP software into this place, first of all, where are we now? So that's been quite interesting because it's always been a little bit anecdotal before as to exactly where we are and what's the metrics we want to use for that. So we've been doing a lot of thinking around that and strategic around that and therefore their investment into where we need to actually be to achieve that. So what does that look like? How many customers, how many licenses, how many buying groups are we dealing with and all that type of thing? And starting to break this down into some moving blocks to deliver to that goal. That's where we want to be. The US is a little bit cleaner in terms of we want to be a leading provider. We call it the, it's called the pro dealership market over there. We're looking at, again, understanding that pro dealership market, how big it is, which as you can imagine, the US is just ridiculous. And what we've got to do to achieve that. So what does that all represent too within the next 10 years? It's looking at understanding what our 10-year goal is, what our 10-year plan is. And in each planning socket we do annually, it's sitting down and actually saying, are we still driving towards that? Are we still going to focus on that and keeping that model working? Excellent. Thank you, Greg. That was my final question. So again, thank you for joining today and for sharing some of your insights and your experience with EOS. It was fascinating to talk to Mm. another EOS implementation practitioner, as you say. I really do look forward to seeing you achieve your, as you say, leading provider here and in the US. And I wish you all the best with the next 20 years of success at Sterling. Thanks so much, Rick. It's been enjoyable. Thanks for that. Thank you.